City. We have the honor tonight of having our uh, Korea flag also as part of the Honor Guard. You know, a lot of places in Minnesota and Wisconsin, when they have their presentations, they present the Canadian flag. And tonight we're honored to present a United States flag with our good friends from Korea, their flag. Present Perms. At this time, we'll say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Order Perms. Rifleman, right shoulder, Perms. Left, face, forward, march. All right, you may be seated. Thank you. I'm not going to have a long uh, speech tonight. We have uh, uh, a nice selection here of uh, Korean Defense Service veterans, uh, Korean War veterans, uh, an American ex-prisoner of war, uh, Purple Heart recipient, uh, and family members of uh, Korea War or Korean Service veterans that were also invited. Uh, I want to apologize first of all tonight that our state commander from the VFW, who was also a Korea defense veteran, was supposed to be here, but he called me two hours ago and said one of his employees had come down with COVID-19 and he had to fill in with him. Uh, I'm also dearly disappointed that uh, our son, Diane and I, our son, Clinton Turla, who is an Iraq veteran and a retired Army captain, also canceled coming tonight because he was exposed to COVID over the weekend and uh, even though he has had the shot, he thought it was better not to be around some of our senior citizens and expose them to the COVID, back, the COVID virus. So uh, this is who we have tonight. We have some Korean War veterans that were clearly invited that for one reason or another decided that they enjoyed the sunshine and weather more than coming to a free meal and a ceremony. Uh, but we do have uh, two honored guests here tonight. We have our city council member, Paul Bradmeyer, is here. And we also have, that's good. And we also have our commander of the local disabled American veterans, Shepherds OD in the back there. He's a Navy there. So oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, I was lucky in my military service that when I enlisted in the Army, when I ran out of money in college, it was right at the end of the Vietnam War in 1973. And so uh, I always tell people that instead of getting sent to Vietnam, I got sent to Korea because I was too big of a target for Vietnam. <laughs> and uh, uh, it was a very a traumatic initial experience for me, leaving my, my wife and son behind and spending 13 months on the DMZ in Korea, where I ended up doing some patrols my last month there as the RTO uh, for their infantry unit. Um, but the nice thing about it was that uh, I took a Korean language course 
Uh, I studied uh, judo and I earned my black belt in, in judo from the Korea uh, Judo Association and that gave me a whole new meaning in my life when I, when I came home uh, to be able to teach judo at the University of Bemidji State and also to teach self-defense courses. Uh, so that was not only learning the Korean language when I was there and meeting the most friendly people that you would ever want to meet, everywhere I went when I was on leave, uh, Korean citizens would come up to me and ask me to either speak with them in English so they would learn English or they would have me sit on their bus because sometimes I think uh, is an old old man in Korea, Obje, Ob yeah, yeah, yeah. would, would, would get up out of his seat. Here's this 70 year old gentleman on a bus would get up out of his seat and have me sit down uh, <laughs> thanking me. Uh, for my service. Uh, and then with uh, my wife, uh, especially Diane, uh, her father served during the Korean War and uh, we only got to know him for about six years before he passed away so I never get to get to talk much about his service in Korea but from looking at some of the photos that he was in from his unit on the bumper of the Jeep, as you know, on the trucks they had the unit, we think he was with uh, one of the first African-American units uh, to serve in the Korean War. Uh, so that must have been quite an honor and distinction for him uh, to do that service. Uh, later, uh, we were honored when uh, uh, we were able to get the Korean uh, uh, Peace Medal, uh, uh, medal I'm wearing in honor of my father-in-law. And Diane has the full medal that she's wearing around her neck. And uh, I wore that medal uh, when the first time we went to Belgium uh, in the year 2000 where I met the Belgian Korean War Veterans Association uh, and they were just so honored to meet a Korean a veteran from uh, Minnesota and we had our POWMI balloon there for their ceremonies and for the next uh, 15 years every time we visited uh, Belgium uh, they would have a ceremony and a dinner in our honor and as far as I know, I am the only American serviceman who was allowed to march in their Veterans Day parade multiple times uh, along with the Korean War veterans. And I know, as a licensed psychologist, I am the only American who assisted a Belgian Korean War veteran uh, to get a service-connected compensation for his PTSD. <laughs> because they just didn't uh, accept that in, in Belgium. And with my report, he was able to get additional compensation for his uh, wounds and his PTSD, and I was quite honored. Uh, now when we go back to Belgium, there was only uh, two families left alive. Uh, most of them served in World War II and Korea, and most of them have passed on. But if you notice at our table in the back, every year when we go over there, they give us these phenomenal uh, gifts and one was a framed a photo of their organization from St. Nicholas, uh, Belgium. And uh, one year, and in my appreciation for them, uh, I purchased uh, 20 K-Bar knives for the 50th anniversary of the Korean War. And you should have seen the person at the baggage check in St. Cloud when he opened up my <laughs> bag and found 20 K-Bar knives in it. And uh, it was just a wonderful reception. And they all had their picture taken. And we sent a letter to K-Bar knives uh, for what we were doing for the Korean War veterans. And uh, as they were coming back from the photo, I'll never forget it, my wife looks down on the floor and she says, is, is that blood? <laughs> and of course, when you give a veteran a knife, they're gonna have to play with it a little bit. And sure enough, one of them cut himself and it was bleeding on the floor. Uh, so that was a, a great memory and uh, great experiences for us. Uh, and then I also brought with me tonight Something that I uh, wanted to do uh, in 1988, my goal was to take my wife and son over to Korea to show them where I served uh, on the DMZ at a base called Camp Pelham. And we were lucky enough uh, to take the train up to uh, Camp Pelham. And on the train, uh, there was an older Korean gentleman who found out that I had served in Korea and wanted to help us, so he uh, offered my wife a, a drink of soju. <laughs> now she had never had soju before and uh, I remember the look on her face when she first took a drink from that bottle. 
but it was uh, quite an honor to have this uh, gentleman share and thank us, Kamsa uh, Hamida, for uh, our time taking up to Camp Pelham. And uh, uh, I think uh, Diane's exact words afterwards were, I've heard these stories and seen pictures, but now actually visiting here, I can experience what you experienced when you were over here for the 13 months you were in Korea. Um, so there's been a lot of, lot of Korean veterans and World War II veterans and Vietnam veterans that have been passing away in the last few years. And as I look at the obituaries uh, every day and see more and more of our veterans uh, passing away, Dr. Kim had uh, called me up and told me that the uh, government of Korea have sent over how many thousand masks? I think they did uh, maybe two million. Two million. Wow. They had sent over two million masks <laughs> to hand out to the Korean War veterans in the United States. And uh, he was willing and offering us uh, 100 of the packages of uh, masks. And my wife, could you hold up the bag there, Diane? Um, each one of you tonight, I want you to leave with one of these bags from the Republic of uh, Korea. And in that bag are 35 uh, COVID-19 masks <laughs> that you can use. Uh, they're supposed to be single-use masks, but I know most people use their masks more than once. But there's enough in there that should last you for a while. <laughs> Along with the masks, uh, there is a letter, a thank you from the Premier of, uh, of Korea, thanking uh, US veterans for what they did during the Korean War. There's also an invitation in there from Dr. Kim and his family, the Kim family. And excuse me, I didn't introduce your wife. Uh, Mrs. Kim uh, is here with us tonight also. She's a retired RN. Yeah. And uh, so you'll have an invitation to the picnic, hopefully planned in September. And uh, also there are some newspaper articles about the Korean War and the Kim family and what they have done to support Korean War veterans uh, throughout their life. So that's my story. Uh, I uh, sad to admit that I was only commander of this post five times. Our current commander has been commander six times, so he beat me. Uh, but I have been the state surgeon for the VFW for 12 years, so I beat him there. And I've also been Surgeon General of the United States for the VFW. Uh, three times and I've been quite honored to serve in that position. So before you leave tonight, we also have uh, challenge coins from my challenge coins as the state surgeon and also challenge coins from the uh, headquarters of the VFW in Kansas City to give each one of you. And uh, later on tonight after Dr. Kim is done speaking, we'll have some door prizes that we're going to hand out along with the packages. So. Uh, with no further ado, we'd like to invite Dr. Kim to address you. I'd like to take a survey. Uh, do, do you like to drink whiskey? <laughs> Would you raise your hand? Not anymore. All right, okay. <clears throat> well, the uh, Korean people faced uh, so much problems uh, feeding uh, their own families. And uh, there was uh, no <coughs> resources uh, for the orphans. The uh, communist North Korea, they invaded the South, and they produced uh, 100,000 orphans. Where did they go? Nowhere to go. Who would take care of them? Not many. When I grew up, I had many open friends in my school. But they, they dressed really, really nice outfit, like a blue uh, trousers with a rolled up at the bottom, and a very colorful uh, shirt, and uh, someone or the uh, wide uh, hat, uh, cowboy hat. Later, I knew that. And uh, some even had. Uh, here, let's just. He's adjusting the volume, Jim. Oh, okay. So keep talking. So. All right. Oh, okay. Um, they, they were shiny leather shoes, and uh, I wore the rubber shoes. So what a contrast. 
And so, and also they brought very uh, good smell uh, cookies and uh, candies, and even some kind of a fruit that I didn't know the name. It smelled really good. Later, I, I knew that it was an orange. <laughs> and I asked the orphan friend, where do we get that? Well, American airmen, American GIs, they brought them to our yeah. home. Yeah. Meaning home means their orphanages. There are many, many orphans who were helped by the generosity of the American GIs and also GIs of families back in the States. These GIs also, they wrote many letters home and their pastors requesting financial help for the collection of their clothing, shoes, toys. The opens had the best Christmas gift year after year, and I didn't have any Christmas gift. I was not a Christian in the beginning, but we went to, I and other friends who, who didn't uh, usually go to church, we went to church in December. Why? We knew that we could be entertained at the church as church is a special Christmas program. There I heard the uh, many Bible stories uh, played by the uh, church members, young and uh, old. And uh, after the service, they handed out the gift bags. In the gift bag, inside the gift bags, uh, rice cake, the cookies, and the candies. They were super treat. But one year, we were just waiting for the bag at the end of Christmas program, but they didn't have anything. So we were very disappointed, and we came home empty-handed. Later, we found that there were so many kids for the program that day. The number of gift bags was lower than the number of kids. So they could not give the gift bags to them. So only in, in, uh, in early January, <coughs> some kids got the Christmas gift uh, in such a way. <coughs> Uh, one more story about the American generosity. You know, Kentucky is uh, famous for the uh, bourbon and the whiskey. And uh, there was uh, an Air Force uh, officer in one of uh, the air base. And uh, he, he tried to persuade the uh, supply officer to provide uh, some uh, building materials for the orphanages. But this officer said, no, we can't give our supplies, building supplies, because we needed them here. And so this, uh, the, another officer uh, did not give up. And uh, he learned that one of his uh, uh, friends would uh, come to Korea. And so he asked his friend, hey, please bring one case of whiskey with you. <laughs> and the boy, he brought one case of whiskey. And so this officer brought this one case of whiskey to the supply officer. <coughs> Will you take this? What do you think he would say? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He said, what do you want? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, then I'll sign up the, uh, okay, the permit for the building materials. Okay, you take as many as you need. So that's the way this orphanages buildings was uh, built here and there. It was not just the uh, orphanage buildings. 
American GIs, they also built the schools. They built the roads. And uh, even one Grand Star General who stationed in Busan, at the payday, the general sat next to the, uh, the officer, and then as uh, the uh, GIs uh, picked up the, their money, and then uh, he said, oh, please remember the orphans. <laughs> <laughs> so that way, the collections were collected for the poor orphans. So over 60,000 orphans were supported by American GIs. And I witnessed that, and I also heard the story. Today, I am, I am standing here before you. When you came to Korea, there was uh, no reason for you to come to Korea. Korea was uh, such a poor country, and the Korean didn't speak English. The Korea did not belong to Western Europe. It was a small place in the Orient, but you are there fighting for us, first of all, to save us from communist aggression by North Korea with the support of Soviet Union and the Red China. I was 60 years old. North Korean troops came to my town. They occupied. And I learned <coughs> from North Korean songs, praise songs of Kim Il-sung. You know, at the time, I didn't know what they wanted the, the little kids to do. You know, we just uh, learned the song, and we sang it over and over. Later, I learned that communists wanted to indoctrinate young children so that young children would just follow the communists, Lenin, Stalin, and so on. They would not allow us, they would not have allowed us to learn the precious meaning of freedom. And then another important thing in terms of freedom, I saw myself many North Korean refugees. They lived in, in Shanty Town and it stretched over miles. And I passed this uh, shed. Their living condition was uh, very, very bad. And uh, this shanty town shed was next, built next uh, to Sliwal. And on, uh, the, the, I, my hometown is uh, Gunsan. And it's on the west coast of the Korean Peninsula. And uh, there, the, uh, you know, the, the waves come and go. And uh, sometimes uh, it almost uh, hit the, uh, the, the sea wall. And so I was wondering how they could uh, sleep in the night when water crashes the sea wall. And then I had this question. Why are they here? Why did they leave their hometowns? They used to pay their respect to their ancestors. When New Year's Day came, when the Lunar uh, Festival Day came, but why did they leave their hometown and why are they living in this uh, hardship? It was the freedom that they wanted to give up No, two things really led me to think about the meaning of the legacy of the Korean War veterans. Now you are here. Have you ever thought about what your legacy might be? 
I'm sure you have your own definition, but to me, the definition of the legacy is for the freedom. Freedom is not free. We usually say this is such an ab abstract meaning. It is not like the socks. It's not like uh, something that I knock on. Then how I could internalize the meaning of freedom? I have uh, many, many stories, but I would like to tell you just uh, two stories uh, tonight. First, uh, Lieutenant Samuel Corson was a graduate of the West Point, 1949, and uh, all these uh, the fresh second lieutenants went to uh, Korea in many different capacities. And uh, at the battle, at one battle, he tried to save his enlisted man, but he was uh, killed later. And uh, when the North Koreans retreated, they went out to the trench and uh, they counted uh, seven North Korean uh, bodies. So this, uh, the Corson, the Lieutenant uh, Corson, fight against uh, this overwhelming North Korean uh, troops. And uh, he killed uh, seven North Korean soldiers and he was killed. Medal of Honor was uh, presented. His wife and his 14 months son received Medal of Honor from General Omar Bradley on October 12, 1951. When I read that story, I of course thought about Lieutenant Corson, his wife, and uh, his son. Why did they have to sacrifice his own life and the life of the, uh, young, the military widow and this the son, 14 months old? And I saw the picture. The baby <coughs> didn't know anything about what was going on. So I thought about that thing very often when I think of my two daughters. What if I was killed to protect other people's life and the freedom? My two daughters would have been in the same situation, fatherless children. And I know that each of you, each of you has your own story. And I have tried to find the human face of the world, how it impacted you when you got home from Korea. And there was no band, no Red Cross, coffee, and donuts. And when one sailor arrived at San Francisco, he asked, where is the band? Where is the Red Cross tent? There was nothing. And at the time, America and the Americans in larger context did not recognize the contribution of what you did in Korea for three years, from 19, uh, June 25th, 1950 to July 27, 1953. But as I thought about the war widows, I tried to make it as if what I could have done to those impacted people. One thing our family did was 
2001, we felt, well, we were so lucky. Thanks to the sacrifice of American service members. And we counted what we could, we have done in terms of our blessings. There were so many blessings. And you know, I take a walk in early morning, walking to the trail is a blessing because someone lost his leg from my leg. When I talk to wounded soldiers, when I embrace them, when I embrace Colonel Weber, who came to the Korean War pic the picnic as a speaker, he lost his one arm and the one leg in the battle of the Wonju. The battle of Wonju is also known as Korea's the battle of Gettysburg. It was crossroads, whether defeat, defeated or to be victorious. The battle of Wonju, he lost. When he came to Minnesota, I tried to welcome him and I embraced him. I usually touch the arm. His slip was just hanging there. When I touch his slip, his left I just could not express my emotions. Oh, he lost his arm from my arm. And so, Gradually, I started internalizing the sacrifice and the hardship. More personally, I would like to, to tell you this story. In 1998, uh, my wife, Jung, and I were at MIT. Uh, that year, my, our second daughter, Gina, was a freshman at MIT, and the MIT had a program for parents in October. And so we visited uh, many different places uh, on campus. And uh, when we went to one building, it, uh, it has a huge hall. And uh, on the wall, there was uh, something. And so uh, as I was approaching the wall, I saw the names. Here, MIT student lost in World War I. And next to that, World War II. And all of a sudden, I asked myself, oh, what about the Korean War? And so I turned, and there was the Korean War. Eight MIT students lost their lives in Korea. And at the time, I could not say anything. I was speechless. I told myself, oh, they lost their precious lives so that my daughter Gina can study here. If they had not lost their lives, what the potentials they could have blossomed in their lives. I'm sure they, he, they would miss the Charles River and the many areas, many buildings in the Boston area. My daughter Gina and we are privileged to see this wonderful parkway in the world, visit the museum. Thanks to the sacrifice, their parents had to endure. Of course, they, 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 they lost their lives. And so I thought that their parents, as a, as a parent, as a father, what if I hear the news that my son was killed in far distant land? 
What do you want to say? How could I hit someone? He's my son. Don't kill him. You know, there were so, so many unexpressible emotions in my heart when I saw the same names. And so the next time, whenever I visited the university and I asked information, oh, do you have any uh, place where you honor your graduates, your students who lost their lives? And I went to Harvard University, and I went to the Harvard Chapel. There were names, World War I, World War II, and the Korean War. Eighteen Harvard students, they lost lives in Korea. And there I recognized one name. He was from Minnesota. We met his wife when the Minnesota Korean War veterans, uh, chapter one, dedicated the, 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 the memorial on state capital grounds in St. Paul. There was one lady circulating the event area. So my wife talked to her, why are you here? And she said, oh, my, my husband uh, was uh, in Korea, and he did not come on. And that name I saw on the wall of the uh, Harvard the Memorial Chapel. And so I have so many stories that I can relate to each of you. And so when someone asked us, why do you do that? You are not the government, you are not the group, you are not an organization, but we like to do as much as we can. And so we really wanted to do something to express our deep gratitude to the veterans, but our life also was a kind of imposing us uh, in many ways, so we could not do that right away. But finally, in 2004, we started hosting this uh, the picnic, the, uh, the Kim Family Annual Appreciation Day picnic and the program in honor of President Truman and uh, the Korean War service members. So it has been 16, 16 years, and uh, last year we had to cancel it, and uh, this year we are going to have on September 18, and I, I hope that uh, you would uh, consider coming, because uh, it will be very, very special and also a meaningful occasion for you to, to express. And then let me uh, finish by just uh, telling you about the uh, scholarship program. Uh, we, we have thought about what would make the, uh, the uh, legacy of your service to continue. So we thought that scholarship would be the best thing to do. So in uh, 2014, we established the named scholarships. Named scholarships means that as we learn about the sacrifice in the battlefield, and uh, then we pick one, and then we give the scholarship to honor him. So right now, we have 20 uh, scholarships. And we ask the applicant to write two essays. <coughs> One, uh, the relationship between uh, myself and my uh, grandpa or grandma, the uh, Korean War uh, veteran. And the other one is the future plan of the applicant. And uh, I read the essays, 
and uh, we have uh, five advisors, four of them are Korean War veterans. And as I read the, the essays, one was uh, quite striking because that essay let me understand that there was third generation who was also impacted by the war. And the student uh, who is the junior uh, at Duke University, he wrote this. I know that my mother had hard time with uh, her father because uh, her father drank day and night. And uh, when she was uh, 15, she lost uh, her father. The way I interpreted that story was that his grandfather, returning from Korea, did not have any recourse to, to heal is a traumatic experience in the battlefield. So he had to rely on the drinking. And because of the drinking, he became violent. And that impacted his family. And this third generation student saw that impact. So war is a hell. <coughs> I'm sorry that uh, I don't mean to uh, say fun, but this is so important for the Koreans to know what you did in Korea. Because what you did in Korea is part of American history, and also that is a part of the Korean history. And so that is why we like to preserve your legacies, so that the next generations will remember what a valuable contribution that you made. Freedom is not free. By saying it, I internalize that. That gives me incentive. That is my motivation to stand before you tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Uh, I know we were going a little overboard here over time, so we want to get you on your way. We have some certificates to hand out tonight <coughs> for the Korean War veterans that are in attendance tonight. Uh, Vern Ness uh, is here. Uh, if you would uh, come forward, Vern, and accept your certificate. And uh, Joe 